This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Act 1. Invisible. Chapter 1. Armstrong. New York City, 1954. Edwin Armstrong had his 13th floor luxury apartment all to himself for the night, just as he had planned. His wife Marion was staying at her sister's in Connecticut. It surprised their live-in cook and two maids with an extra night off work. The world-famous inventor, Ivy League professor, and multimillionaire placed his handwritten suicide note on the bedroom dresser and walked to the window. He slid it open, feeling a shock of freezing winter air wash over him. The Armstrong sprawling 17-room apartment was the sort of place most New Yorkers dreamed of living. Known as River House for its location on the western bank of the East River, the 26-story Art Deco Tower had been designed in the Roaring Twenties to cater to the top rung of Manhattan's social ladder. Its other 55 apartments housed neighbors with last names like Roosevelt, Hearst, and Rockefeller. The Armstrong apartment, set at the midpoint of the building's A-line, offered one of Riverhouse's signature views, a panoramic sweep from Brooklyn to Queens, across Roosevelt Island, and up the Manhattan skyline running north along the water's edge. In past summers, the river had served as convenient parking spot for his neighbor's yachts. Tonight, a fierce wind blew up river, speckling the dark water with whitecaps. To his fellow New Yorkers, the day just ended had been an ordinary Sunday, but to Major Armstrong it marked an important anniversary. Forty years ago he had witnessed the full power of his first invention, a discovery that kicked off his career as the most prolific inventor since Thomas Edison. On that long ago January 31st in 1914, a twenty-three-year-old Edwin Armstrong had embarked on an unusual adventure— Back then, the ability to send information through the air was little more than a parlor trick. Consumer radios had not yet been built, or even imagined. The only thing the airwaves were good for at the beginning of the twentieth century was zipping Morse code dots and dashes a few dozen miles, useful for communicating with ships at sea, but little else. Armstrong believed he had invented a device that could change that, grabbing enervated airwaves drifting in from clear across the Atlantic and reinfusing them with enough power to make them detectable, a feat that wireless experts considered impossible. That's when David Sarnoff first entered the story. An acquaintance of Armstrong's, Sarnoff shared the inventor's youth and optimism, and was one of the few people to believe Armstrong's idea might actually be possible. Since Sarnoff worked for a company that owned the world's largest antenna, he offered to connect Armstrong's device to the antenna and put his claims to the test. The results shocked even the two young optimists as they suddenly began to pick up wireless signals being sent from the far side of the planet. From that day on, Armstrong and Sarnoff's fascination with the untapped power of the invisible waves would bond them and set their lives on parallel paths. Armstrong's imagination, talent, and luck continued to astound. Following the creation of his tool to make weak airwaves stronger, he built a device that made it easy for a radio transmitter to summon the invisible waves. He followed that with a breakthrough that allowed engineers to change an airwave's length, multiplying their information-moving power once again. Invisible waves controlled by Armstrong's discoveries would deliver the sound of Duke Ellington's jazz to radio listeners, the sight of Jackie Gleason's antics to TV viewers, and the location of incoming Nazi bombers to the Allied Air Command. Like Thomas Edison, who kept working into his eighties, Major Armstrong had maintained his passion and creativity as he had aged. Twenty years after their trip to test out his first invention, Armstrong invited Sarnoff to his lab at Columbia University to show him yet another invention, FM radio. Edwin Armstrong's biggest mistake, as he now saw it, 
had been his naive assumption that the David Sarnoff who showed up for the FM radio demonstration would be the same giddy engineer who had accompanied him twenty years earlier.